Music is found in every known society, past and present, and is considered a universal language that all human beings understand. Hi, dear learners! I am Teacher Jason, and you are watching DepEd TV. Today, we will visit the time when the Western art music was developing in Europe. So, be ready with your pen, paper, and self-learning modules. Listen carefully and take down notes as I explain the performance practices of music of the medieval, renaissance, and baroque periods. In the medieval period, the Catholic Church was probably the most dominant institution in society. Annotation, like the new, was the only tool used for worship. During this period, music was written only by the monks for the church. That is why only a few composers were recognized and one of them is Pope Gregory I. Pope Gregory I created the Gregorian chants. These Gregorian melodies were traditionally sung by choirs of men and boys in churches or by men and women of religious orders in their chapels. In the medieval church, music was organized according to the needs of the liturgy. With the desire for self-expression, secular music was formed outside the church. The secular troubadour music talked about chivalry and love. Composers of troubadour music were not monks, but nobles. The most important among these nobles was Adam de la Halle. Adam de la Halle, also known as Adam Lamassou, was one of the earliest secular composers whose literary and musical works include chansons and poetic debates. His musical play, Jus de Robin et Marion, is considered the earliest surviving secular French play with music. Entertainers from this period were called medieval minstrels. They were poets who sang and entertained people for a living. Because most medieval minstrels were traveling from place to place, they did not have a permanent abode. While modern musical traditions in the West were based on the principles of antiquity in the notated music of the early church, a secular music practice also existed. But because of the big influence of the church, the line between sacred and secular aspects was unclear during the medieval period. Next, let's talk about the performance practices during the Renaissance period. Renaissance music was an essential part of civic, religious, and courtly life. The exchange of ideas in Europe, as well as the political, economic, and religious events in the period, led to major changes in the styles of composition and music dissemination and in the development of new genres and musical instruments. The invention of the printing press in the 1400s paved the way for a wider distribution of Renaissance compositions. Some of the notable composers during the Renaissance were Palestrina and Morley. Born in Rome in 1525, Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina is said to be the greatest master of Roman Catholic Church music. Majority of his works were sacred music in the 16th century. He also served as an organist to many churches. Palestrina's Pope Marcellus Mass is held up as the perfect example of the Counter-Reformation style. Thomas Morley, who was born in East England in 1557, had been a singer since childhood and eventually became a chorister. Unlike Palestrina, who devoted his time to sacred music, Morley 
published his own collections of madrigals that showed a variety of color, form, and technique that contributed significantly to the history of music. With the emergence of the bourgeois class, Renaissance music became popular as entertainment and activity. Moreover, the human voice, whether in solo or in ensemble, was the most commonly accepted medium of performance for all Renaissance music. Apart from these, there was a unity of style in both secular and religious music that applied equally to vocal and instrumental compositions in the Renaissance period, the Western art period that is known to be the golden age of a cappella choral music. Finally, we will talk about the performance practices during the Baroque era that stretches from 1600 to the 1750s. The Baroque era features the works of Bach, Vivaldi, Handel, and many more. Johann Sebastian Bach, a German who came from a family of musicians, was a religious man. His deep faith was showed in his sacred music. He was known for his compositions for the organ, the orchestra, and the oratorio. His works include the Brandenburg Concertos, the Mass in B minor, Cantata 208 and 211, and Fugue in G minor. Italian Baroque composer Antonio Lucio Vivaldi, also called the Red Priest because of his red hair, was a virtuoso violinist. Vivaldi was known mainly for composing instrumental concertos, especially for the violin, as well as sacred choral works and over 40 operas. His famous piece is The Four Seasons, a series of four violin concerti depicting each of the seasons. Another German named Georg Friedrich Händel also became an influential figure during this period. Georg secretly taught himself to play the harpsichord despite his father's opposition. He studied counterpoint, canon, and fugue. Händel is remembered for his operas and oratorios. He lost his eyesight in 1753. The Messiah is Handel's most famous creation. In the Baroque period, composers expected musicians to add ornamentation, including trills, mordents, turns, appoggiaturas, raised notes, and passing tones. The use of vibrato was also considered an ornament. In addition to adding ornamentation, performers were expected to improvise. Dynamic changes during the Baroque period were often abrupt shifting immediately from soft to loud and back. There is a spirit to every age, every composer, and every piece of music. During the Baroque times, secular and sacred life were very much interrelated, and music was not only to be enjoyed, but also respected as a spiritual gift. We have already explained the performance practices of music of the medieval Renaissance and Baroque period. Let's try to check whether you can still remember the music that were played during the discussion part of the lesson. Your task is to listen and identify whether the music that I will play for five seconds is from letter A, Medieval, letter B, Renaissance, or letter C, Baroque. If your answer is letter B, then you're right. The correct answer is letter C. Good job! You're fantastic! Letter A is the answer. If your answer is letter C, you must be sensational.
And the correct answer is letter A. I'm proud of the way you work today. Keep it up. Music is the most dazzling fruit of human civilization that has become the massive global craze today. Without a doubt, the vocal runs of Beyonce, the riffs of a lead guitar, the yodeling of Elvis Presley, and the whistles of Mariah Carey must have originated from the distinct characteristics of vocal and instrumental music from the three eras. It should also be noted that performances in the medieval period were directed to the church. However, secular music like that of troubadours were for entertainment. Obviously, in the Renaissance period, polyphonic music continued and was used widely in instrumental, vocal, and combined performances, both in sacred and secular. Finally, the true essentials of Baroque music are the love and respect for the music, enjoyment in performance, and above all, clarity in the articulation, ensemble, and recording balance. Dear learners, see you again in our next episode here on DepEd TV. I am Teacher Jason saying, if there is no music, there will never be a human soul because music is the language of the soul. Don't go away because you will also discover Western classical art traditions with your art teacher, Sir Rafi. all over the Philippines. I'm Sir Rafi B and thank you for still watching DepEd TV. All the way from the land of sweet surprises, welcome to Negros Occidental. Are you ready to get your heart racing? I'm sure you are, so stay tuned and be ready with your paper, pen, and self-learning module as we take the astonishing journey here on Art Mart. Last week, we had a great time discovering the distinct characteristics, elements, and principles of art in the different periods. Well, the tour doesn't stop there, because today is another brand new opportunity for a new art amazing trip, as we rediscover ancient, classical, and medieval art traditions, and representative artworks and artists from various art periods. Before we go, let's see what our RT BFF has prepared for you. Hello there! I have invited an Art Smart to share her reaction about our last episode. Hello fellow Art Smart! Last week, I really enjoyed our tour! And I was amazed by the wonders that the different areas of art has brought to the world! And I can't wait to keep on learning! Let's make the most of this art amazing time! See you around Art Smart! Good to hear that from you, Cami Rose! Sir Rafi, back to you! Our trip today will focus on the three categories of Western classical art tradition, painting, sculpture, and architecture, hidden in these three treasure chests. A painting is a two-dimensional visual image created by an artist applying colored pigments or paint as medium using a brush. Sculpture, on the other hand, may be two or three-dimensional visual images that are made through any of the four basic processes, carving, modeling, casting, and constructing or assemblage. Architecture is the art and science of designing buildings and structures related to environmental formation that provides people with shelter to live in, work in, play in, and store in. At the end of the tour, you need to pass the smart of task that RTV will give you to unlock two symbols in our medallion. This medallion will serve as your key to the art-amazing world of Western classical art tradition. As we go along, you will have to unlock three treasure chests that will reveal marvelous wonders from the past. Since you are now time travel ready, let the astonishing journey begin. Can you see the first treasure chest? Great! But in order for us to open it, we need a key. And to get the key, you will need to ace this task. Among the three artworks, which one is different? 
You got it! Now, can you tell what kind of artwork is this? You're right! This is a painting! Now, you can open the treasure chest! This is the cave of Lasco during the prehistoric era discovered in Marcel Ravidat in Montignac, France on September 12, 1940. Take a look at this one! This is the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun discovered by Howard Carter in November 4, 1922 in the Valley of the King, Egypt. In the walls of King Tutankhamun's tomb were paintings of his life and the scenes he expected to encounter in the underworld. The Greek produced the Judgment of Paris in 575 to 550 BC. It was painted on an amphora, a black figure pottery from Attica, which displayed the veneration of gods and heroes. Bits of panel in 540 to 530 BC was discovered during the 1930s in a cave near the village of Pizza. The tomb of the diver built in 470 BC and discovered by Italian archaeologist Mario Napoli on June 3, 1968 in Campania, southern Italy, is a grave made of five local limestone slabs forming the four lateral walls and the roof and slabs carefully bonded with plaster. Now, let's have a glimpse of the Roman artistry. Head of Alexander, created in 100 BC, illustrates a battle in which Alexander charges the Persian king Darius in the Battle of Issus. Borso Tricate Pompey is an example of a fresco landscape painting believed to depict a ceremonial rite, either a marriage or the initiation of a woman in a mystery cult. The Byzantine Empress Theodora in the Basilica of San Vitale, Italy, is a mosaic of an Asian queen with dark eyes and hair with a fierce expression. The Romanist Cries in Majesty by an artist named Master Tall in Barcelona is a Spanish fresco transferred into a canvas in which Christ is depicted in a full frontal view with the Gospels on his left and his right hand blessing the viewers and surrounded by mandorla or the almond-shaped frame. And for the Gothic style, we have the Lady and the Unicorn Tapestry from 1506 to 1513. It is a series of six tapestries created in the style of Thousand Flowers, often considered as one of the greatest works of art of the Middle Ages in Europe. The Shepherd David from the 13th century is a Gothic manuscript illustration which shows some realistic detail and naive naturalism. These paintings convey ideas of the tradition and culture of the artist. They are capable of transmitting their message from one generation to another. Can you see the second treasure chest? Fantastic! But in order for us to open it, we need a key. And to get the key, you will need to get the correct answer in this task. Among the three artworks, which one is different? You got it! Now, can you tell what kind of artwork is this? You're right! This is a sculpture. Now, let us open the second treasure chest. Venus of Villendorf was found on August 7, 1908 by a workman named Josef Zombathy in Villendorf, Lower Austria and was carved from oolithic limestone showing heavy breast and a large abdomen which was believed to be a charm to ensure fertility. Venus of Brassimpui, on the other hand, was discovered in a cave at Brassimpui, France in 1892. A sculpture carved from a mammoth piece of ivory is a lady with a hood which shows a human face and hairstyle. This most copied work of ancient Egypt, the Queen Nefertiti bust, was created in 1345 BC by Thutmose in ancient Egypt and discovered in Amarna on December 6, 1912 by the German Oriental Society. This is a statue of Pharaoh Menkora and his queen, discovered by George Reisner on January 18, 1910, carved in a smooth grain dark stone called gray wax or schist that created a sense of eternity and immortality. This Greek sculpture, the Discobolus of 460 to 450 BC by Myron of Eleuthera, depicts a youthful ancient Greek athlete throwing a discus. The original sculpture was made of bronze but was lost. The sarcophagus from Sevitiri from the late 6th century BC is made of terracotta, showing a husband and a wife reclining comfortably as if they were on a couch. Consisting of five ivory plaques that fit together, Barberini Diptych at Louvre Museum represents the Emperor Justinian I as a triumphant victor. 
Last judgment was carved by Gis Libertos before 1135 in Cathedral of St. Lazare in Autun, France in Romanist style. The artists of these sculptures surely poured out their hearts into their work, inspiring them to produce such marvels. So if you plan to make a sculpture, do it with a whole lot of passion. I think you can see the third treasure chest. But then again, in order for us to open it, we need a key. And to get the key, you will need to get this task done perfectly. Among the three artworks, which one is different? You got it! Now, can you tell what kind of artwork is this? You're right! An architecture! Here are the architectural works from the prehistoric era. The Menher is a huge stone standing vertically on the ground, usually standing in the middle of the field or arranged in rows. While dolmens are stone tables consisting of two huge standing stones supporting a horizontal giant stone which served as a grave or as an altar. This is the Cromlech. It is a circle of standing stones considered as a temple where rituals were held. Behold, as we visit these structures that have stood the test of time. You're right! I'm talking about Egyptian architecture. Egyptian temples served as places of residence of the gods and key centers of economic activity and official worship of the gods. The Mastaba is an Egyptian tomb in the form of a flat roof, rectangular structure with outward sloping sides made of mud bricks or stones and marked as burial sites of many eminent Egyptians. The Parthenon, which was constructed in 447 BC and completed in 432 BC in Athens, Greece, by the architects Ictinos and Callicrates, along with a sculpture named Phidias, is the greatest classical temple dedicated to the goddess Athena. Rome's Colosseum from 70 to 82 AD is an oval amphitheater built from travertine limestone, soft or volcanic rock, and brick-faced concrete used for gladiatorial concerts and public spectacles. The Byzantine period's Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, Turkey was designed by Isidore of Miletus and Anthemius of Tralles in 537 BC. The Gothic era's Cathedral of Chartres or Notre Dame Cathedral is the first high Gothic cathedral with thousands of sculpted figures and splendid stained glass windows. These architectural structures have lasted for a long time because of their strong foundation. In these trying times, may we be as strong and grounded as these structures so our stories will be heard by the future generation. These masterpieces are powerful tools that reflect culture and tradition. Before we go back to the present, RTB is here again to challenge what you know. Hello, Art Smarts. It was an artful visit from the past. Let's play Pick That Style or Era. I challenge you to identify the periods that these photos represent. Now it's time to smart up. You have 5 seconds for each item. Picture number 1. Venus of Willendorf. This sculpture was created during the prehistoric era. Picture number 2. The Colosseum. This was constructed during the Roman era. Picture number 3. Judgment of Paris. The Greek era. Congratulations, Art Smarts. You successfully unlocked two symbols in our medallion. I am so proud of you. Sir Rafi, back to you. It was a jam-packed trip, right? I hope you took selfies while we were on tour. Share it on Facebook and use the hashtag ArtSmart and get the chance to be featured in our next episode. That's it for our art punishing journey today. This has been Sir Rapidly. Let's keep on creating art. Me, ArtSmart.